You've probably seen the famous depiction of a monkey progressively turning into an upright human figure, evolution from monkey to man. What data supports this artist's rendering in our school textbooks? The scientific evidence for ape man doesn't stand up to scrutiny, and Christian leaders trying to fit them into Genesis are seriously mistaken. Coming up next, Ape Man, The Grand Illusion with Dr. Terry Mortensen. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Today we have Dr. Terry Mortensen with us, and Dr. Mortensen is going to be talking about a subject that everyone has heard about and we really need to know more facts about, and it's this whole thing of ape and men, the grand illusion. Has man evolved from ape? Or is this a fairy tale that's been told to us? Dr. Mortensen, good to have you with us today. Good to be with you, Don. You've given a great deal of study to this subject, and I'm excited for our people to know what you have to share. So, let's begin for us. Uh, the evolution of man, well, where does it start? Well, probably everybody has seen a diagram like that, uh, convincing it's... us that uh, we evolved from some ape-like creature. Unfortunately, it's in most of our children's textbooks, isn't yep. it? And we're, we're, as adults, we're told this regularly. Absolutely. Time Magazine, 1994, How Man Began. Uh, 2001, How Apes Became Human. National Geographic, 2002, The First Pioneer. You're looking at the first pioneer there. How about that? And then Scientific American, A New Look at the Human Past. <laughs> and Natural History, New Faces of the Human Past. <laughs> So they really want us to believe that we evolved from some ape-like creature. All the evolutionists and creationists have the same data. They have the same skulls, same jaws, fossils, yeah. bones, uh, and living creatures. But they have two different ways of interpreting it because they have two different sets of starting assumptions. That's right. The naturalistic assumptions that everything can be explained by time and chance and the laws of nature, and the biblical view based on the eyewitness testimony of the Creator. And one of the key creatures on that evolutionary tree are the Australopithecines. Uh, Australopithecines. Probably most people have heard of the most famous Australopithecine. Uh, her name is Lucy. Yes. Uh, Donald Johansson and his team found the bones in 1974 in Ethiopia, and they, they found about 40% of the body. It wasn't nicely laid out like that, but uh, because of the symmetry of the body, they could reconstruct about 70%. And uh, it's interesting to see then what they reconstruct based on their assumptions from those bones when they make a museum display. So here, here she is, Lucy, at the Natural History Museum in London. And you can see that she has human hands and human feet and an upright posture just like you and I have. Uh, there are some evolutionists and all creationists who would say that that is a serious misrepresentation of the uh, evidence and that really she was a knuckle walker similar to a pygmy chimp or a gorilla. But that's Lucy in, uh, in London at the Natural History Museum. Now I want to show you Lucy in St. Louis <laughs> because the St. Louis Zoo had a Lucy exhibit and there she is. And you can see that she's got a lot more hair but she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture. <laughs> and then the Chicago Field Museum also has an exhibit and uh, that's Lucy in Chicago. She has heavier eyebrow ridges, a different face from the other two, uh, not as much hair as St. Louis, but you see all of those, th those uh, facial features, there's a lot of imagination going in 
based on the assumptions of the evolutionists. How human-like was this creature or how it, it, ape-like? It's very telling that they can take the same set of bones and come up. really shows you that we don't know very much about what you really look like when you look and, at the different... And assumptions and imagination play a big role. That's right. Well, this is a, a BBC television program in 2006, and look at that. That face is different from the others. Yeah. So the bones don't tell us anything about the face. Now I want to show you a video uh, that features Dr. Owen Lovejoy, who is a, another prominent evolutionist uh, anthropologist. And uh, he's doing something to the hip bone, a plaster cast of the hip bone of Lucy. And, uh, and I want you uh, to, to listen to what he says. And the voice in the background is Donald Johansson, who found the bones of Lucy. So this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Well, Don, of yeah. course it looks like ours. <laughs> he ground the bones to look like ours. Uh, that's unbelievable. It's and, unbelievable. And if a creationist did that to the fossil evidence or a plaster cast of it, he'd be crucified. Sure. But the evolutionist does it, and this is good science. No, I submit that is a manipulation of the evidence. You don't even really want to find the truth if you have to grind it to make it work. Right. That's scary right. to me. Okay, Lucy then doesn't have much validation. What about Neanderthal? Well, uh, that's the way the Neanderthals were pictured in 1856 when they found the first bones in the Neander Valley in Germany. And uh, he's very stooped in the shoulders, uh, uh, ape-like in the head, and... Uh, over the years, they found more Neanderthal skeletons in Europe and in the Middle East, and uh, now there are evolutionists who say that if you dressed Neanderthal in a coat and tie and put him in, a, in Grand Central Station in New York City, uh, nobody would take a second look. Oh, so, he, he, so this is, uh, we're going the other way. This is really human. Right, right. Now, there was an article uh, recently in Time magazine called The Changing Faces of Neanderthal, and they showed how Neanderthals have been represented over the years. So here you have in, in uh, 1873, he needs a haircut, but otherwise he could be an Olymp American Olympic athlete. Then in uh, 1909, he's uh, human below the head, but ape-like in the head, and naked. Of course, the fossil record doesn't tell you whether he was naked no or not. No the bones, no. Right. And then in 1953, <laughs> he's ape-like in the head, but he's behaving very much like yeah. humans. Yes. <laughs> uh, in 1984, oh, he's really uh, he needs a shave and a haircut, but otherwise he's human. Just a regular human. In 1988, he's showing us that he needs to get to the dentist, but he's human. But then in uh, CNN in 2006, they had him looking more ape-like. In Newsweek in 2007, he's got a whole lot more hair, and in... Uh, Science Daily in 2008, he's perfectly human. So it's just the artistic imagination. Yeah. In fact, the, natural, uh, the uh, Neanderthal Museum in Germany had a display for many years with the uh, 1909 and the 1983, and one evolutionist said, uh, from his bestial 19th century persona to just another guy in a suit, Neanderthals have been pigeonholed according to the times. Wow. The, the Neanderthal Museum has changed their exhibit, though. Uh, a couple of years ago, they made a new exhibit, and, and that's Neanderthal. And, uh, you know, they're, no they're perfectly evidence, human. Just a different perspective, yeah. different imagination. I mean, he's got a big nose, but, yeah. you know, I notice some people uh, today that have big noses. That doesn't mean you're subhuman. And that lady could be in any of your classes at school or whatever, and you'd never know. Right. Yeah. So the fossil evidence didn't change. It was the interpretation based on the assumptions of 
How ape-like or human-like was this? You know, assumptions and imagination aren't really scientific facts, are they? No, they're different. And yeah. those assumptions yes. and imagination flow out of those worldviews that That's we talked right. about in a previous program. You know, then some people say, yes, but the Neanderthals were really primitive. They had primitive culture. That doesn't prove they were subhuman. Because no. when George Washington was president of the United States, living in, in culture in uh, Philadelphia, in the very same country at the very same time, were Native American Indians living in teepees w without that fine culture of China and cutlery and toilet in the house. And, sure. And they were just as human as George Washington. <laughs> And uh, we have people today that in our Western arrogance uh, we call primitive, like the Aborigines of Australia. But they're not subhuman. They're Australian Aborigine kids that go off to university. Uh, they're different from us. But if you drop me by helicopter into their, into their forest with just the clothes on my back, I'd probably be dead in three days. You know, I'd eat some poisonous plant. They're, they're pretty smart for where they live. Oh, absolutely. They're yeah. fully human. And, and culture doesn't make us more or less human. There's, that's, that's right. There's nothing we're, evolutionary we're, about that. It's just different. Right. It's yeah. just different. Well, then people say, yeah, but there were cave, they were cavemen. They, well, they're cavemen in the Bible. No ape men, but cavemen. Hebrews talks about people who wandered in deserts and mountains and caves in the holes of, and there's a lot of caves in the, in the Middle East and Israel because of limestone. Yes. Don, Sarah, Jacob, and Lazarus were buried in a cave. That's just true. like Neanderthals buried their dead in caves. Sure. And Lot, Elijah, and David were living in a cave for a while. That's Why right. were they living in a cave? It's safe. Yeah, it's safe, and the necessities of life required it. That's right. Lot was told to get out of Sodom. He didn't go where he was supposed to. He went up into a cave in the, in the mountains. And Elijah and David were running from the king who were trying to kill him. And, and Dr. Mortensen, that doesn't make it any less human that you're hiding in a cave. That, that's right. But they, they, were, they were going to a safe place. That's right. And you know, we have cavemen today. That's true. One of the most famous ones died just recently, Osama bin Laden. And why was he living in the caves of Afghanistan, we believe? He was hiding there. He was hiding. The necessities of life required right. it. And there's nothing subhuman about him. He's very, very uh, normal human being. And so uh, the, the archaeological evidence that Neanderthals were human is just overwhelming. Uh, they, they made sophisticated spears, needles, and stone tools. Thank and only, only humans do that. That's right. Oh, a, a bird may use a piece of straw to get a bug out of a tree. A monkey might use a stick to get an ant out of an anthill. But only humans make tools. tools. Uh, they used makeup and seashell jewelry. That's they really? a rather recent discovery. Wow. Uh, they, use makeup. they hunted dolphins and seals. And humans are the only land animals, the, the land creatures that do that. They had controlled use of fire and cooked their food. Animals don't do that. And they built huts from animal skins. Now, a beaver will build a dam, a bird will build a nest, but they don't build their homes out of the skins of other animals. Uh, they, the Neanderthals made flutes out of bear femurs. And, uh, you know, a bird will sing. We once got our dog to sing. Uh, but, but animals don't make musical instruments. No. And they made uh, sophisticated ones. They cared for their sick and ceremonially buried their dead. They made and sailed ships and boats. Mercy. And they possessed the hyoid bone in the voice box, which scientists say is almost identical to modern humans, and they had the speech-associated gene FOXP2. So the Neanderthals were our relatives. Lucy wasn't, but the Neanderthals were. And they were just different from us because of the, different the genetics and the culture. But, you know, this evidence is overwhelming. I mean, it's irrefutable when you put all that together that these were just human beings living in a different situation than we live in. We've got to take a break. Don't you go away. There's even more problems for this ape-human uh, connection and we'll share them with you when we come back. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Terry Mortensen, has a PhD in the history of geology and has lectured on the creation evolution controversy in 21 countries since the 1970s. He's also author of several books, including The Great Turning Point. 
you'll definitely want this for your personal library. Book orders are being taken at 1-800-778-3390. Dr. Mortensen is a speaker, researcher, and writer for Answers in Genesis. For more information, write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org. We are back with Dr. Terry Mortensen. We're talking about these illusional missing links. And we've looked at Lucy and we looked at Neanderthal. One was clearly not a human being. One clearly was Neanderthal. But uh, as you look at this whole thing, there's more problems with the missing links, aren't there, Terry? There, there are, Don. And uh, I think people need to be aware of some of these. Yes. Uh, consider Piltdown Man. He was uh, announced in 1912. And the evidence for Piltdown Man uh, was announced in the Illustrated London News. The evidence was a piece of jaw, two molar teeth, and a piece of skull. That's all they had. And uh, on the basis of that, they had the, the, uh, the confident interpretation that he was a half a million to a million years old. And the Geological Society said, there's no possible doubt but that these bones represent a man who must be regarded as affording us a link with our remote ancestors, the apes. All of that from a jawbone, two teeth, and a piece of a skull. Right, and no possible doubt. Yes. Well, uh, the, the uh, Illustrated London News had a picture of him, but later there was some other artwork, and uh, that's how he was pictured in, in some other artwork. But uh, the bones went into the Natural History Museum in London, and uh, there were scientists who said, you know, we would like to look at the bones, and the Natural History Museum said, well, we'd be happy to show you a plaster cast of the bones. Uh, and the scientists said, well, we would like to actually look at the bones. And they said, we'd be happy to show you a plaster cast of the bones. They didn't allow anybody to look at the actual bones until 1953. And the reason for that is? Because when they did look at them, they were exposed as a hoax. The jawbone was from an orangutan that had died about 50 years earlier. The skull was human. They dated it with carbon-14 to be about uh, 500 years old. And the teeth had file marks on them when they looked at them under the microscope they had been intentionally filed to make them look more human. Terry this is the most disillusioning uh, aspect of this whole creation evolutionist debate. You know I love a good debate when everyone's searching for the truth but when one side isn't looking for the truth when they're simply seeking to deceive people it troubles me deeply and that's what we find in the record here isn't it? Th that, that's exactly what happened and, and we have to ask if evolution of man is true as evolutionists were claiming in 1912 why would they have to create a hoax to convince the public of this isn't that something just give us the solid scientific evidence just give us the facts well then there was Nebraska man in 1922 yeah. and uh, the illustrated London News had a picture of what he and his wife were doing when they lost the only piece of evidence they found which was a single tooth <laughs> and from that tooth they reconstructed the whole scene uh, Nebraska man was used as evidence in the Scopes Evolution Trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. And, uh, <clears throat> and what kind of tooth was it? Well, it was a couple more years before they found more evidence of that creature. And they said in a technical article, not for the general public to hear, oops, we made a mistake. That was an extinct species of pig. And so I like to say this is a case where a pig made a monkey out of a man. Yes, I'm afraid. Uh, then there's uh, an interesting article in National Geographic in 2000 that I, I couldn't believe was there when I saw it. And I want to show uh, you uh, and, and your viewers everything on that one-page article. They had a picture of these six bones and a piece of jaw, and they said this, It's hard to find someone who can draw a realistic-looking early <laughs> hominid. That's why the Geographic's art department conducted a search for new talent. <laughs> Four artists were picked to receive casts of two million year old female Homo habilis fossils. From these bits of evidence, they were to sketch in skeletal and fleshed out form the hominid to whom the bones belong. So they're supposed to draw a complete skeleton and then what the creature looked like when it was alive. And this is what they started with. Right. Yeah. Then the article says each artist had two weeks with the bones before they were sent to the next person's. And uh, they said research was completely up to the individual. That's why their work looks so different. There's no one way to draw her. There's oh, no well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, let's look at what they drew. And consider first that the only thing they have from the head is the jaw. Okay. 
It said paleontologists re reviewed the results. Intrigued with all four entries, the art department has invited the artist to paint finished versions based on the input from the consultants. But the consultants don't have any more evidence than the artists. And they're not as good at art. <laughs> so here's, here's the heads. Ape-like head, more human-like. Ape-like, ape-like. And then let's consider the rest of their body, and we need to remember that they only had six bones. But look at those bones, Don. None of those bones are complete bones. They're bone fragments. And there's nothing dis distinctive about them. They're just little sticks-like right. shaped and, things. And now the artist is going to have to imagine how long the bone was when it was complete. And uh, we also need to remember that humans have an arm-to-leg ratio of three-quarters to one. So if we stand up straight, our, arms, our hands come to the middle of our body. But apes have much longer arms. And uh, so let's look at what they, what they drew. And remember, there's no one way to draw her. Right. Okay. No one so way. let's look at the first one, human length arms. Okay. Second one, getting down to ape length arms. Getting longer. Third one, human length arms with curved hands to give it the tree dwelling look. And then uh, the fourth one, those arms look pretty long. Yeah. They're getting down there to ape like. Uh, this is not science. This is artistic imagination. You know, I'm always told that creation be belongs in the religion department. Uh, there should be a division between the artist department and the science department, yep. don't you think? Yep. That's where the real division ought to be. Right. And, and again, the assumptions yes. are driving the Everything interpretation of the Everything is based on what evidence. you think ahead of time, or what your assumptions are. Well, where's the evidence? I mean, we look at all this artwork, but where's the evidence then? Well, it's in the bones, but uh, look at Lucy's baby, a stunning fossil announced in Scientific American in 2006. The bones they found are represented in the uh, orange or yellow there. The white is imagination. And uh, they told us that they, uh, they found shoulder blades and neck vertebrae like a gorilla, inner ear canals like African apes, a long curved finger like a tree-dwelling ape, but look at the arm. All they have from the arm is a bit of the upper arm bone and that finger. <laughs> and yet they've drawn it a human length arm. Yes. And then uh, the voice box, they said, was like a chimpanzee, and the cranial capacity was like a chimpanzee. So all the evidence, by their own words, is as an ape. Yes. But I didn't give you the whole title of the article. It didn't say Lucy's baby, a stunning fossil. It said Lucy's baby, a stunning new human fossil. <laughs> but they should have said a new ape fossil. Absolutely. But if they'd said that, there's no reason to publish the article. And, and they're not, yeah, they don't get any press and they don't get any money for their next research. Nope. Yeah. And so this is just more ape man deception. So uh, we've seen that there's various ways you can make an ape man. You can take a few human bones, add imagination, and make an ape man. Or you can take a few uh, ape bones. Or you don't even need one, you can use a pig tooth. <laughs> add imagination. And there's lots of plaster paris out there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And uh, you can take a few ape bones and a few human bones, add imagination, and make an ape man. And if all those methods fail, you can always get an electric grinder or a file and change the shape of the bones yeah. and make an ape man. But I, there never has been. You know, our show is very valuable. You're doing a great work for us here because I think this is a show that many of our viewers ought to own to show to their children so that when they come home and they've been taught in school that there's irrefutable evidence that we've come from a common ancestor, when you look at this, it just debunks the myth, doesn't it? Yep, yep. We've looked at a number of examples, and we could give a lot more, but there's no evidence that man evolved. Uh, instead, imagination and art are the key. And, and over time, the evolutionists are really getting more confused. Every new discovery, they have to change their, their, their theory. And uh, so it really is a confusing mess. It, it's always been amazing to me that they can make these horrendous deceptions and then come up with something all new and everybody forgets the last deception and believes the next lie. Uh, you have to want to believe the lie. Yep. Do yep. Dr. Mortensen, help us with the moral implications of this. Well, you know, if we really are descended from an ape-like creature, then that means that we're just animals. Yes. And it's the law of the jungle. Yes. It's the survival of the fittest. And if I can, uh, if a monkey steals his, uh, his friend's banana, that's not morally wrong. That's just what monkeys do. Sure. So if I steal my neighbor's property, or I kill my neighbor to get ahead in life, or I lie or cheat at business, what's, what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, I'm just an animal. The Bible says that the thing that distinguishes us from the animals is that we were made in God's image. That God put his stamp, a, a spiritual fingerprint on every human being that makes us distinctive. 
that we have the capacity to commune with a God who is a spirit, to know God and to be known by God. When we muddy that up and make us just animals, A, we ought to expect our kids to act like animals, mm -hmm. and B, we lose the most precious part of being human. We lose the concept that we can know God and be known by God. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of stake here. Yep. And, uh, and we shouldn't allow the lie to stand if it separates our children from the truth of God's Word. That's right. Thank you for helping us today with that. And folks, I hope you've heard this show. I hope you'll get a hold of this show. And when your kids come home and tell you that they've been proven that men and ape have come from a common ancestor, get this program out. Take it out the video, play it, play it for them, and show them that there is no evidence because you've been uniquely made. You know, God knows that he created you. You need to know it too so that you can build your relationship with him because he's the only one who understands that you have been created in his image, an eternal being, to live somewhere forever. I want you to spend forever with God in heaven. And that's why it's so important that you get your worldview right and that you know the truth that will set you free. We've heard truth today. I hope you'll apply it to your life and to your heart. And I hope to see you again here soon on Origins. And until then, God be with you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1403, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.